Okay, I'm going to actually start the pivot uh, in this uh, on this panel because the first two talks were about what happened in the election. The second two are possible consequences of the election. Uh, this is also compared to the other presentation. It's going to be relatively data light uh, because a lot of what I want to say is what does the academic study of world politics tell us about the consequences of having a new president? Um, and, and so I'm going to try and summarize that kind of quickly and give you my thoughts on that. So the first thing is that when, we, when a new president comes into office, this creates an opportunity. And that's because we often talk about like national reputation. How do other countries view the credibility of what the United States does? And the key observation here is, though people often talk about this as adhering to the country, in some ways it's actually better thought of as adhering to the leader. And therefore, if, if it really in some sense attaches to the president, then when you have a new president in, this creates a great opportunity, which means that a new president can change the international reputation of the United States. So if you went back eight years ago, one of the large advantages that President Obama had when he came into office was, well, it wasn't tattooed on his forehead, but everyone else around the world saw, not Bush. And that that, that created opportunities for him to change things in many different ways about how he was seen around the world. And one way to think about this then is the turnover in the president is essentially like the big reset button on US foreign policy. There can be both changes in the policy itself, but also importantly, changes in the way others view the United States, what it's trying to accomplish, and the credibility of it a, a, as a country in foreign policy. So now one might ask then, well, what is there out there to deal with in one form or another? So what, what is the legacy of the Obama foreign policy and the effects it has on the reputation of the United States is seen through it. And this record is mixed. There's some good things and there's some bad things. So looking at the good things first, uh, I would say the deal on new Iranian nuclear enrichment, in my view, this is the least bad option. And it should be, should be seen as one of the accomplishments of the president. Second is the year old Paris Agreement on Climate Change, which while in many ways is a very, very not a very, very rigorous agreement, but it's a major step towards moving to trying to address the issue over the very, very long term. Uh, number third on this that I, would, that I think he deserves a lot of credit for, that's particularly relevant with the passing of Fidel Castro last week, is the opening to Cuba, because it creates a possibility to finally reopen Cuba, at least to the United States, and reintegrate it in a way that's natural. And finally, the last sort of big uh, sort of move in the Obama administration was the pivot to Asia which was often thought of in military terms, but also was an economic strategy to try and reassure East Asian and Southeast Asian countries that the United States would be there for them on both levels, and that therefore they should try and adhere to the United States as opposed to adhere, as opposed to move to China. Those are the good sides. Now, there are also some bad sides out of, out of the Obama administration. And major one of these is the mess in the Middle East, of which the Syrian civil war is a major disaster that the administration is not entirely responsible for, but has, has some responsibility for it in the way it's acted and the policies it's had towards Syria. That it's taken a bad situation and in many ways made it worse. Uh, this, of course, leads to the, the rise of the self-described Islamic State, the same situ similar situation in Libya. Um, the consequence of these producing the, the growing Iranian-Saudi rivalry, which manifests itself in conflicts throughout the region, the resulting refugee crisis, and then in Afghanistan, the resurgence of the Taliban. These are all things that, are in some sense, are failures of the Obama foreign policy. Connected to that is the growing challenge of Putin's Russia at, at many different levels to the US-led international order uh, on a bunch of different phrases. And then finally, the last of these that's relevant here is the uncertainty about the relationship, the US relationship with China and where exactly it's going. Um, and this is particularly important because uh, it is the most important relationship in world politics now and will probably be over the coming decades about how will the United States and China deal with one another over time. Now, here the key thing is not necessarily the policies per se, and this is why it was, was relevant here. What I see as the fundamental problem of, of, the, of the Obama foreign policy is not the policy itself, it's the disconnect between words and deeds. That is, saying one thing and acting another way. And that that's important because it, it corrodes away reputation. And that has contributed, particularly actions like this in the Middle East, that have then exacerbated problems with respect to Russia and with China. 
Okay, so then what I want to ask is, the question you'd like though, so what will Trump do? I have a very simple answer on this. I have no idea. <laughs> but I want to qualify it a little bit, explain why I have no, I, no idea what Trump is going to do once he's in office. And some of these have to do with the nature of foreign policy in a new administration and the connection between what happens in a campaign and what a candidate does once they actually get in office as president. The first of the, and of course here the, the question is, so presumably Trump in a new position has the ability to restore the reputation of the United States so that others it, around the world see a connection between what the United States says and what the United States does. And now the question is, can he actually do that? Is he capable of this? And I want to suggest there's some reasons why I have no idea what he's going to do that are related to this. The first of this has to do with the way he talked on the campaign trail. Um, Donald Trump was quite happy to contradict himself, quite often in the same paragraph, sometimes in the same sentence. Uh, this makes it very hard to know how much credence he puts in words and how he uses them. Furthermore, he often would adopt contradictory positions very, very, you know, in very, very short periods of time. You know, it, it was very, very striking that, that on one day during the campaign when he flew down to Mexico City, had lunch with the president of Mexico. Everything's nice. And then that evening, he's back up in Arizona announcing that we're going to build a wall and Mexico is going to pay for it. It's like the ability to keep those two things in, in, within the context of a day is, is, stun is stunning. And so as a result, it's, one thing that's generally true is it's very hard to tell what the positions he, or, or sort of the, the many things he said on the campaign trail tell us anything about what he might do because often they're quite contradictory. But there's another reason beyond this that's not specific to Trump about why we shouldn't necessarily put too much weight on what was said in the campaign trail, which is that campaign statements are generally a poor guide to what presidents do in foreign policy in office. So as I was thinking about this talk, you know, I think about things like in 1992, candidate Bill Clinton talked about how he was going to use trade as leverage to get China to improve its respect on human rights. And then President Clinton was the one who extended most favored nation status to China and helped China get into the World Trade Organization. Similarly, 2000, candidate George W. Bush argues, well, we're not going to engage in big nation building projects because that's we're not going to do those anymore. President Bush then launched two of the largest nation building projects this, this country has ever been involved in, first in Afghanistan, second in Iraq. And in 2008, candidate Barack Obama talked about how he was going to close the, the detention facility at Guantanamo Bay. And here we are eight years later, and it's still open. OK, so one thing that's key out of this is, is to understand that there's a number of different reasons why candidates often act differently from what they talk. And that particularly in foreign policy, statements made during the campaign in some sense carry much less weight than those do on, on domestic policy. And to show you that I have some support for this, I'd like to say, this message has been improved by Donald J. Trump. <laughs> OK, so then the question is, why do things look different in office? And there's a variety of different reasons here. And part of it is foreign policy, unlike domestic policy, where it's a question of, can you get the different parts of the American government to do what you want? Can you get the bureaucracy to respond? Can you get Congress to pass the legislation you want? How does this interact with courts? What about the states? In foreign policy, you have to wonder about what others outside the country will do. Because foreign policy is not just a question of what the United States wants to do, but how are others going to react to this? And there are a number of different ways that make it so that, that in foreign policy, there's reasons why presidents act differently from the way they talked on the campaign trail. The first of these is that policies that are popular with US voters may not work internationally. This is the story of Clinton and using trade to try and affect human rights in China. That the belief was that, well, you might get leverage there, but the damage you might do would be different from that. And as a result, that may not make such a good idea to, to pursue that policy. Hence, the change between candidate Clinton and President Clinton. Second, often when you get in office as the president, the interests that you represent change, and they look different when you're sitting in a position representing the country overall. In some sense, this is the issue that, that President Obama faced with closing Guantanamo, which is it appeals to a, large, for a notable number of voters, and therefore it's a useful thing to talk about on it. Then you start to realize, wait a second, that's a lot more difficult question to talk about what does it mean to actually close the detention facility? What are you going to do with these people? And, and what about pushback on other parts of the government against this? So it, it gets more complicated. 
And the third is, of course, the Bush problem, which is that you can come in and say, we're not going to do nation building, and then 9-11 happens. That leads to the overthrow of the Taliban in Afghanistan. And now all of a sudden, because the environment has changed dramatically, what you might have wanted to do on the campaign trail in 2000 doesn't look like the thing you have to do when you get to the winter of 2001, 2002. And so as a result, the, the key is that often what candidates talk about in foreign policy and what they end up doing is different. Second big thing about this is that the foreign policy team tends to matter a lot. Uh, much more than promises, because foreign policy often is a process where there's input from a lot of different interests that ha have different priorities around it, and they work through those things. And so the foreign policy team is often really important. And of course, at this point, we don't know a lot about what that team looks like. There are understandably some concerns about the people who've been, who've been announced already. Uh, most notably General Flynn and whether or not he's, he has sort of the appropriate breadth of view for what you want out of the National Security Advisor. But a, more, a deeper concern for me is that you know, during, the, during both the primaries and the general election campaign, a substantial number of Republican intellectuals, including Republican foreign policy intellectuals, announced themselves publicly as being in the never Trump crowd. This is particularly important because one of the big things presidents do is they appoint thousands of political appointees. These people fill a lot of the key, key positions. They matter a lot in foreign policy because these are the assistant secretaries and undersecretaries and all those people who help fill out a lot of the day-to-day -day things on policy that may not get to the level of, of the president. And as a result, what I'm concerned about in particular is if a large portion of essentially the in intelligentsia of the Republican Party is excluded from office because they are never Trumpers, either, by, either because they don't want to serve, which many don't, or alternatively, Trump is unwilling to, or, or and Trump's team is unwilling to allow those people into key positions, you may end up with an unusually thin and narrow bench in that. The other thing that makes it difficult about this to predict is that it's often, and in foreign policy, often the case that political appointees turn over quickly. You know, thinking back to other elections, you know, who was the key sort of senior foreign policy person in the beginning of the Reagan administration? It was Al Haig. You know, who then announced that he was in control, but he was out of there as Secretary of State in about a year. And so the one thing that makes it hard to tell is we don't know what that team is going to look like. So if, if as has been floated around, if, if Trump was to select Mitt Romney to be Secretary of State, well, there's presumably going to be a lot of conflict around that inside the administration. Who's going to win that fight and who's going to stay there? Okay. so. Now let me go back to the other question, which is what might Trump do? So I want to talk about some of those accomplishments on the, on the Obama side. And the first of these is that because of the partisanship in Washington, Obama heavily relied on executive orders. Now the advantage of this was that meant he didn't have to go to Congress to get things passed, or he could arrange votes in Congress that would allow the executive order to stand, like on the, on the Iranian nuclear enrichment deal, um, without having to get full-fledged support from Congress. What this means is, particularly in the Iranian nuclear deal and the Paris Agreement, these are things that, that Trump has relatively strong power to tear up relatively quickly, um, and, and therefore very well might do that. Now, uh, let's see, we'll go back. I'm going to talk a little bit about each of those. Now, that doesn't mean he's going to do these. You know, with the Iranian nuclear enrichment deal, if you think about the consequences here, now, the Iranians aren't very happy with the way this deal has been working as it is, because they expected much more sanctions relief. And it, the probable response is that's not just a U.S.-Iran deal. That's a deal between, between I believe what they call it, the P6 plus one. And, and as a result, there are a lot of other countries there. Their reactions, particularly in places like France and China and Russia, is going to be, look, the party that reneged on this is the United States. We're going to keep doing business with Iran. And as a result, even though Trump undoubtedly has said on the, on the, on the campaign trail that he would like to tear up that deal, he very well may not do it because the consequences are likely to, to, to not produce the effect that he wants. Um, similarly with the Paris Agreement, because, a lot of, because it's essentially voluntary and very, very long term, it's entirely possible that he would not remove the United States from that. Okay, in terms of initiatives he might do, well, presuming the area of trade, which is one he talked a lot about, that the Trans-Pacific uh, Trans Partnership, that should be TPP, not TTP, and TTIP, the deal with the EU, are almost certainly dead. And then the other question is whether or not there's a looming trade war. I will point out one of the things here is that 
one thing, there, there is one piece of logic behind Trump's rhetoric on the area of trade, which is to shift away from multilateral uh, negotiation to bilateral negotiation. One reason why you would do that is the United States has far more leverage in a bilateral deal than it does in a multilateral. If we go and deal one-on-one -on -one with Vietnam and trade, we have more leverage than as in TTIP where there's 12 to 14 other countries at the table. Is he actually gonna cozy up to Putin? We'll see. Um, you know, that one I don't know. Uh, in terms of relations with NATO allies, this is actually one where his rhetoric has been, has been I think, most damaging because in some sense it would be better if he just abrogated NATO because then it would be really clear. But by making statements like we might protect them, we might not, that is we might observe our treaty obligations, we might not, you're creating uncertainty. And that uncertainty makes things worse. Clear abrogation might convince the Eastern Europeans who feel themselves threatened by Russia that it's time to flip sides. Finally, what to do about the Middle East? Uh, this is an interesting question because he's talked a lot of different ways. He doesn't want a big involvement, but he wants to, well, I won't repeat it, but it m involves bombing <coughs> out of them. Um, I have no idea what he's going to do about that and, and talk about that. He certainly, the people we've seen so far are relatively hawkish on that. Uh, whether or not they'll actually follow through on that, we don't know. And that's what I have to say. Thank you.